True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht and you're listening to my interview with Dr. Hestel van Staden, Senior Forensic Pathologist and star of the Via television series Autopsy. This episode is sponsored by the upcoming new release, suspense-filled action movie, Hot Seat. Orlando Fryer is a former criminal hacker trying to rebuild his life on the straight and narrow, save his marriage, and keep a birthday promise to his daughter. But when he takes his seat in his office on one very ordinary morning, everything changes, and he's suddenly thrust into the role of not only saving his life, but the entire city from a pressure sensitive bomb strapped underneath his chair. One problem though, the bomber has painted Orlando as the perpetrator, so the police don't see him as a victim. As the bomb squad make their way up 80 floors to Orlando, precious time is ticking away. Starring Mel Gibson, Kevin Dillon and Shannon Doherty, Hot Seat releases in cinemas on the 22nd of July, and I've got four sets of double tickets to give away to four lucky True Crime South Africa listeners. Check out our socials for details, and thank you to Hot Seat for supporting True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to to Jennifer Twashenka, Her Majesty the Queen, Anya Mola, Lindre Rogers, Darren Yechels, Mish, Michael Bluff, Michelle Shepard, Melissa Muniz, Nikki Brower, Kiara Drood, Shani Marsh, Zaib Ibrahim, Clea Yanakis, M. Kaprakin, Liesel, Armand Berger, Belinda Bennett, Carla Turner, and Lulama. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. In addition to the shout-out and monthly exclusive episode that Patreons get, I also now upload an ad-free version of every week's episode to Patreon. So if you prefer not to hear the ads, head over to Patreon and sign up for a minimum monthly contribution of just $1, which at the moment is about 16 rand. It's a pretty good deal. If you like discounts, because who doesn't, head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, print crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for 10% discounts and support the show at the same time. And you can get 10% off when you order from Wallpaper Online by using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser, and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use. My podcast journey has put me in touch with some seriously interesting people. I really enjoy chatting with and interviewing people who work in various fields related to true crime, because Firstly, they're just interesting people, and secondly, I learn a lot from these conversations that I can apply when I cover cases for the podcast. I also think that as a true crime-consuming public, we almost have a responsibility to learn as much as we can about the reality of what happens behind the scenes, so that we can consume this content in an open-minded way. Dr. Hestel van Staden is a forensic pathologist. She's one of the last people who sees a deceased body before it is laid to rest. She also recently set aside her scrubs and protective gear for the relative glamour of the small screen in a television series currently being aired on DSTV called Autopsy. I had the distinct pleasure of chatting with Dr. van Staden about her career the show, and a book she's writing. Here's my interview with her. 
The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. I'm Estelle van Staden. I'm a senior forensic pathologist working in Johannesburg. When I interview people in interesting professions like this, I always like to understand how they came to be in those occupations, what inspired them, and even the academic route they took to get there, because that usually makes for an interesting story. But it also helps others who may be considering these professions themselves, or have children who may want to pursue it. Okay, so I think my route is maybe a bit different from other people's. I was in the fortunate position that I actually chose forensic pathology rather than choosing medicine. I was 14 years old when I decided I wanted to do forensic pathology. So I've always known that I wanted to be a doctor. You know, I grew up with my father watching things like Quincy and Murder, She Wrote, and by nature, I'm very inquisitive. I also read a lot. And when I was 14, like I said, I started reading Patricia Cornwall's case called PETA series. And it's just like the penny dropped. I just realized that this is exactly what I want to do. So I actually did medicine in order to be able to do forensic pathology and not other way around. I then started studying medicine, finished medicine, did a year of internship and a year of comm serve. At that stage, we only did one year of community service. And then I started doing some assistance in theater, which has actually stood me in very good stead. I also did a few locums and I was involved in a clinic at Netcare's Garden City Clinic, where we did executive medicals and insurance medicals. And in 2006, I then applied for a post in forensic pathology and I started as a registrar. Eventually writing my exams towards the end of 2009, I wrote in August, I qualified in October of 2009, but you also have to finish your time. So I wrote my exams basically in three years time, but you have to finish four years before you can qualify as a forensic pathologist with a HPC's A. So I then qualified in June of 2010 as a forensic pathologist. I am a huge fan of the K. Scarpetta series too. And I love hearing that it's inspired someone to go into this field. With Dr. Van Staden having worked in what I call live people medicine for a few years before going into pathology, I wondered how different she'd found that work from her work as a pathologist. Yeah, it's quite different. <laughs> I think you get used to your patients lying very still when you do what I do. And funny enough, you know, when there is any movement from a table where a body is lying, it immediately catches your eye and it freaks you out. You know, not really freak you out, but it's immediately something that's out of the ordinary. Although there's lots of people walking about and so forth, when we're actually doing the postmortems, everybody on the tables are obviously lying dead still. I must be honest, it wasn't that I didn't enjoy working with live patients. I did, but that absolute love that I have for forensic pathology, simply that, that didn't drive me. So it was as part of the process, you know, working with live patients doing general practice. And what I must also add is the fact that I worked in, in theater for hmm, three years was absolutely to my benefit. I enjoyed the, the interaction with other professionals. I gained some invaluable experience I made very good friends. Some of them I still consult or consulted to a large extent until recently. Quite a few of the doctors that I work with have passed away since. But they became my, my mentors before doing forensic pathology. And if I wanted to know how to do something that required surgical skill, I would still phone them. And I think it also helped me build my own surgical skills for when I do post-mortem examinations. So it's really worked out to my benefit the way things have played out. The other career I considered was doing internal medicine. And I loved doing internal medicine. That for me was very, very nice. You can actually compare that with forensic pathology. It's the same thing, you know, getting to the bottom of a problem and realizing what is the background to this and, and what happened here. 
I said to Dr. Van Staden that being a forensic pathologist is almost like being a detective of the body. In the same way a detective would look for clues at a crime scene, which when assembled paints a picture of what happened there, pathologists are collecting clues during a post-mortem, which when assembled will provide a picture about how you treated your body while you were alive and what might have caused your demise. I asked Dr. Van Staden what reaction she gets when she tells people what she does for a living and how, if at all, her work has impacted her personal life. Look, it's either, I always say, it's either a, a conversation stopper or a conversation starter. People are immediately interested in what you do. I was at a tea party, in fact, last week, Friday, and the friend whose birthday it was mentioned to people that I'm a forensic pathologist. And it's like this hush came over the entire conversation immediately. And the next minute, there were just questions from everybody. So I do think it's quite an unusual occupation. And people have lots of questions. It's also, I think, because people don't really know what happens after a person has died. When is a postmortem required? When, or medico legal postmortem required? And what the processes are. So I think that's also why there's so many questions and why people are so intrigued. I think what we do is kind of steeped in mystery. With regards to how it impacts on my personal life, you know, I try to keep the two separate as much as, we, as I can, but my phone is on 24-7 and my phone number has been doing the rounds in any case because I've been doing this for such a long period. So often I get phoned by doctors requiring advice on, in terms of whether postmortem is required or, you know, any advice on the medical legal kind of sort. So my children are very aware of what I do. So they're also used to my phone ringing at all funny times. In fact, my one child, I started off by telling them I'm a police doctor because, I mean, I don't think any child wants to know what his mother does if they do forensic pathology in much detail. So we started off by, by be telling him, yo, well, I'm a police doctor. And then one day he asked me, so mommy, do you, do, do you examine all the sick police officers? And I realized, okay, this is a bit of a misconception. I need to, you know, now he's old enough to start explaining it. And over time, I explained to them what I do and what it entails. Obviously not in great detail. The one is very interested. The other one is completely, he gets grossed up if, if you tell him anything with too much blood and gore. So, and obviously they are young children, so I don't want to expose them too much. Also, I deal with a lot of trauma. I remember walking into the postmortem suite one day and a person was hit by a train. And I looked at this body and I thought, what I'm seeing on a daily basis, no person should ever see. But you learn to deal with that. You learn to, to compartmentalize, I would say, to a certain extent. You leave it at work and you you deal with it on a cerebral level. You don't deal with it emotionally. It's not my family member. It is somebody else's family member. And I never want to lose compassion. And I never want to lose that out of the eye. But you cannot stand next to the body like they show on TV and cry for every single body because you will never make it. And if that's the case, you're also not going to get justice for that person because you are going to get so emotionally involved that you're going to miss things you're not going to be able to pick up everything that you should. What has happened to me, though, is I've been involved in two armed robberies. And after the second one, when I went back to work, the first postmortem I was meant to do was that of a person that had been shot dead in an armed robbery. That, I must say, really freaked me out. And it just you know, brought home what I do and and how precious life really is. Um, I also remember that during the first robbery, when I looked at this gun being pointed at me, I remember seeing in my mind's eye what a gunshot wound looked like. And I just realized I need to do everything to, to not end up there. So I do think it impacts on us, but it also helps if you're able to speak to people. You know, obviously you can't speak to your family about what you're doing, in terms of details and in terms of what we see every day, because we, to a certain extent, I think, are, have learned to deal with the trauma of what we do. We're also quite a verbal department. So the fact that you can verbalize what you're saying and what you're seeing and discuss it with friends who's in the field, that, that helps a great deal. 
but um, you can't really discuss what you, what you see with, with family and friends, firstly because it's confidential, but also you don't want to traumatize them. The concept of compartmentalization is a common theme I hear from people who do jobs like this. And Dr. Van Staden is right. No human being should have to see another whose body is so completely destroyed and experience such excessive trauma. But like so many of these jobs, someone has to do it. So they put their emotions in a box and set it aside so that they can do their job. And maybe that box gets opened later, and maybe it doesn't. But if they don't do that, they can't do their job effectively. I need to look at every single detail. I need to take in everything I see, everything I smell, everything I hear when I'm there. So it's important that I don't get distracted by my own emotions or thinking about, oh my word, this person is the same age as I am. I mean, you, it's not as though you don't take cognizance of that. You do. But you need to be able to put that on the back burner. And I don't think I'm particularly emotional. I think I'm definitely more of a left brainer. So I think that also helps. But often afterwards, one needs to verbalize what you've seen or discuss it. And that tends to put things into context. And you realize that you are actually there to help seek justice for whatever the situation may be. If you keep that at the back of your mind, then, then it also helps. I asked Dr. Van Staden how she feels about the current state of forensic pathology in South Africa. What are we doing well and what are our challenges? Look, I think we are training excellent pathologists. I think we all, I'm quite involved with training as well. And for me, it's really important that we train good pathologists, people that's able to, to assist court, to assist in the process of justice. I really think that's important. And it's not only me, we all share that same viewpoint. The issue is that we are quite overburdened. There's only something like 60 something fully qualified forensic pathologists in South Africa. So we are bleeding forensic pathologists. They often leave and go overseas. They don't remain in the service. It's just that we are so incredibly busy and there is such an overwhelming amount of unnatural deaths that require post-mortem examinations that I think we are overburdened. Also, in terms of budget, one can imagine that obviously the, the majority of the budget will go towards health care for living patients. And I don't think that's wrong. One understands that. Um, it makes perfect sense. I think we are always kind of fighting for budget. But one understands where that comes from. But like I say, there's a huge number of postmortems being performed in South Africa, and the majority, I would say, is not are not being performed by, by forensic pathologists, but rather by forensic medical officers, simply because there aren't enough forensic pathologists in the country. The international figures show that in America, the National Association of Medical Examiners recommend that pathologists don't do more than 250 postmortems per year and definitely not, not more than 325. Now, I mean, just looking at my figures, I've done more than 5,000 in my lifetime. It shows you that I've definitely done more than those numbers per year. I mean, I don't think there's a single year where I've done less than what they recommend. So we are quite stretched, but like I say, we are really attempting to train good doctors because we see so many things and because we see such a large amount of trauma. I think our guys are ex incredibly experienced. We always joke and say that people in the US write textbooks on something they've seen five times. Meanwhile, we see 50 of them, but we simply don't have the time to write textbooks because we are just too busy doing the actual work. With this high rate of attrition, I asked Dr. Van Staden how we could encourage more medical students to specialize in forensic pathology and also what type of person would be well suited to this work. Nicole, if I had that answer, <laughs> um, I think the problem is you can't just say, well, let's take anybody in because my feeling always is that you need to love this job. This is not the kind of thing that you're going to do and be able to continue doing if you don't love what you do, because it, it takes quite a toll. It is, it is quite a strenuous occupation, and you really need to be 
you, you need to be wanting and able to fight for justice and that must be your aim you know the issue is that you need to take into consideration as well that with other specialities people can qualify and then go work in private that's not really the case with us mostly they're going to have to work for state simply due to the fact that the law is just phrased in a certain manner so all the and that unnatural deaths per definition has to have a government post-mortem examination a medical legal post-mortem examination which makes perfect sense and that's the way that it should be but you can imagine that people don't always want to work for government sure there are private pathologists and they all work in private but once you've it's not like in another speciality where people can qualify and immediately leave and go work in you know, work in private, people want to know how much experience do you have? They're not going to ask you for your opinion unless you have been doing this for quite some time and you are experienced because of the gravity of the things that we deal with. Not that I think that other specialities don't have that, but, you know, that's the first thing they want to know. How much court experience do you have? How many post-mortem examinations have you done? Have you seen this and that amount of trauma? In terms of what the requirements would be, in my opinion, I think you need somebody that's very resilient, somebody that's tenacious, somebody that can stand their ground. You know when you're doing forensic pathology that you will be exposed in court to people who might not like what you're saying. I mean, I've had a defense advocate say straight out to my face in an open court, well, if this post-mortem had been done according to international standards, what, what, what. And fortunately, I was not intimidated by her and I could tell her, well, actually it was done um, according to international standards and can I refer you to this and that. And in fact, I could also, I, I had the benefit of knowing that they were looking for a second opinion, which they couldn't obtain because the other departments actually said to her, well, they agree with the report. But you need somebody that's not going to be completely smashed if they have somebody saying that to them you also need somebody that would probably have a bit of thick skin when they do go to court somebody that's meticulous that don't mind going back two and three times checking the same thing a bit of OCD I think also helps you know I've left the autopsy suite and then thought yes I can't remember if I checked this or that and I went back and I checked it the second or third time and the other thing is I think one always needs to remember when you're doing pathology, that you are not the judge and the jury for whatever is happening or whatever happened. You know, we do postmortems on people that were involved in crime as well, so the perpetrators, as well as on the victims. And it's not your place to actually decide what happened before, who was wrong and who was right. You know, if you can get us some more of those people, that would be great. With more than 5,000 autopsies under her belt, You'd think that Dr. Van Staden's memory of most of these would have all merged into one by this point. But with her clear and intense focus on the humanity of the people who arrive on her autopsy table, many of the cases she's seen stay with her. There's always cases that remain with you. I've mentioned in one of the interviews I did, I remember doing a postmortem, or two postmortems in fact, on what I thought was either the father or the grandfather and then the little girl who'd been involved in a pedestrian vehicle accident. And, you know, it was very similar to other postmortems, but I think what got to me in that case was the fact that I could see in my mind's eye this older person grabbing this little girl's hand and running across the freeway before being struck. You know, and that just it saddened me so much that to this day I still remember it. I can't remember the specifics. But, you know, the situation just got to me. And um, my first professor, Hendrik Schools, always taught me to, to, he told me, see the video. You've always got to see the video. And I think that's very important in forensic pathology, seeing the video in your own head. Because then you can, then you will always know, yes, this fits or no, this doesn't fit. I need to look for something else. When you present it with a scenario in court, you can say, yes, it can work or no, it couldn't. Another one that I remember from when I was very junior was a lady that was found in, if I remember correctly, the southern parts of Johannesburg along the mine dumps. She had just been dumped there. And I actually read in the newspaper the following day or the day thereafter that her she had this beautiful flower, orchid of some sort, if I remember correctly. 
and how they had waited for this flower to bloom. And the day that she was abducted and then died, this flower actually bloomed. You know, and it, I could never follow up on it. I could never find out what happened afterwards, as unfortunately happens most often. But that was also something that struck me. You know, it's the it's the human part of the stories that that remains with you. I had a did the postmortem by the mother and the baby, where the the mother was accused of having murdered her baby, and she then committed suicide. And on the day of the baby's death, or the day the after, I can't remember very well. And I was very junior. I think I was actually still working with Professor Scorse at that stage. So that must have been within the first six months of my starting at forensics. And the baby had actually died from um, a respiratory tract infection of some sort. So it was a natural death. And the mother committed suicide because the community was blaming her for something that was entirely out of her control. You know, so that's the kind of cases that stick with you. Um, the little boy that was shot by accident in, I think it was Parkmore a few years ago, also where the owner of the house thought he heard a sound and he himself, I think, had been robbed before and fired a warning shot in the direction. And it was the lady that was working for them. It was either her son or her grandson that was then struck um, by the bullet and killed. You know, it's those are the stories that remain with you. And I think that you carry along I suppose, forever. And I find these answers truly amazing. You might expect someone like Dr. von Staden to remember the weird and strange cases. But no, it's the ones with the very simple but poignant human elements that stand out for her. The woman whose long-awaited orchid bloom came on the day of her death the mother whose community unfairly turned on her, the child who became a victim of someone else's trauma. You know, for me, it's always a question of this is somebody's relative, whether it's their father, their mother, their child, their whatever the case may be. And that's how I treat every single person that comes across my table. I don't think of them as being the robber or the the victim. To me, it's a question that this person was loved by somebody at some stage and I need to do the best of my ability to do the best postmortem I can. It's not my place to judge them. It's not my place to have an opinion on their life or how they got there. I try to see the human behind what we're doing. I think all of us at the mortuary are very very aware, you know, it's a privilege dealing with people's families and, and helping them find answers and getting them or helping them to get closure. I think one should never, you know, lose track of that. I think it's important for us to understand when a forensic pathologist comes into the picture after a death. So I asked Dr. Van Staden to explain what might happen after a body or death is discovered. So only when a person dies an unnatural death, and that's defined in the law, would they actually require medico legal postmortem examination? If they had died a natural death, they are still allowed to undergo, a med- well, a postmortem, not a medico legal, but that would be private and they would have to request that from a private pathologist. That can be arranged. So if a person dies an unnatural death, the police is involved from the, from the get go. The police then complete what we call a SAP 180 form. So that's the form that firstly gives us information regarding what happened to this person i'll get back to that in a second but secondly it also gives us the authority to do a medical legal postmortem examination because you can imagine that we can't just grab anybody off the street and decide that we want to do a postmortem on this person there's severe consequences to that so on that sab 180 they are meant to indicate the race the gender the age and any additional information that they might have what happened to this person who was involved? Do they know what happened to this person? Unfortunately, we often don't get much information. I think the standard line is found dead and felt or found dead. So thereafter, they would then, the police would actually investigate the scene, investigate the surroundings, investigate the circumstances. 
our guys from forensic pathology, our forensic pathology officers are then contacted and the body is then removed to the mortuary. Identification takes place either before or after the postmortem had been conducted. It is not a requirement for the postmortem. You can imagine um, if you look at the amount of bodies that actually remain unidentified at our facility and across South Africa, that if we had to wait for every single person to be identified, there's quite a number of bodies that would never undergo the required postmortem examination. We then continue to do the medical legal postmortem, after which time a report is generated. That report goes into our admin office and it can only be issued to the investigating officer in terms of the law. So that officer would then collect the report and from there it either goes to inquest court or to just normal, you know, the MPA to the prosecuting authority. So in cases where there's clearly been um, crime, it would, um, these dockets would go straight to the MPA and somebody would be prosecuted if they knew who the person was to be prosecuted. If, for example, a death such as a suicide occurred, that docket gets referred to the inquest magistrate. So in an inquest court, nobody specifically is being charged with anything, but certain, certain findings need to be made, such as the, the identity of the deceased, which sounds ridiculous, but sometimes we get very decomposed bodies or bodies that were burned beyond recognition. So the first determination is the identity of the deceased, the date when the deceased passed away, the cause of death, and then is there somebody that can be held accountable for this person's death? So in, for example, a case of, um, for example, a suicide, nobody can be held accountable because the person that's accountable has died in the process. But sometimes, and the good example, I think, is the Annika Smith case in Pretoria, when inquest is being held to see, is there anybody that can be charged with her murder? So they know it is a murder, but they don't know who can be charged. And in such a case, there's interested parties, not accused parties, and everybody is allowed to have legal representation present, but nobody's physically being accused of anything. So that's the two paths that it goes, either to the NPA or to the inquest magistrate. And sometimes we are asked to testify in either one of those instances. Obviously, if it goes to open court, then we are, you know, then we testify in open court. But with inquests, either it is what we call an, an open inquest where we testify or a paper inquest. That would just be where the magistrate looks at the documentation and like in a suicide, see, well, there's nothing that looks suspicious and he signs off on the case and it would then end there. Unidentified bodies in mortuaries always make me think because I wonder how many missing person cases could be solved if that body could be linked to a missing person's report. So I asked Dr. Van Staden what measures they take when they have a body that's unidentified in order to keep some record to use to identify that body after it's either been cremated or buried in a municipal grave. What we do is we actually take fingerprints on all the bodies so that we have some kind of record, and it's then the police's job to try and identify bodies with fingerprints. We don't take, as far as I know, DNA from every body. I think the system is quite overwhelmed. But yeah, we do sometimes take DNA, like in cases where a person is burnt beyond recognition, where we might have an idea of who that person is, and we then take DNA as confirmation. Remember the issue with DNA is that if you take DNA, you need something to compare it with. I think that's the problem with things like CSI, they look, you know, they create this impression that you take DNA and it's like an ID card just pops up. There's no full reference bank of everybody in South Africa's DNA, you know, or that you submit a sample as you cross the border and so everybody in the country has a DNA reference sample somewhere. So the minute you take DNA, it's, it's useless until you have some, some DNA to cross-reference it with. Remember how Dr. Van Staden spoke about how she sometimes would be driving home from an autopsy and start to wonder whether she'd looked at something and she'd go back and double-check? Well, she did that with this interview too. The day after I chatted with her, she remembered something she wanted to tell me about the identification of bodies, so she sent me this voice note. 
at Roberg, we are quite privileged to actually have a human decedent identification unit. They do ID and attempts to identify the unidentified bodies, which we have quite a number of. They work in conjunction with the SAPS VIC unit, ICRC, which is the International Red Cross, and also the Witt School of Anatomical Sciences. So that's actually of quite a bit of assistance in terms of identifying um, unknown people, some of whom might be migrants. In many of the cases I've researched, I've heard how important it is in investigations for the investigating officer to attend the autopsy. There is so much to be gained from the exchange of information between the forensic pathologist and the I.O. during the course of the post-mortem, and yet it rarely seems to happen. I asked Dr. von Staden what her experience has been around this. Look, I mean, I think it's one of my major bugbears that they should be attending post-mortems, but we don't see that, unfortunately, and I think it's due to a glitch in the system on the one side. I think on the other hand, sometimes the, these people that simply don't like attending post-mortems, but it certainly is incredibly beneficial to us and to them if they attend the post-mortem examinations. When you are there, you can immediately exchange information. So I can immediately understand what happened at the scene, what are they thinking of, what was found, what's important, and I can also immediately convey certain things to them. I think you need to look for this as a murder weapon, or this is something that's very strange, or I don't think, you know, this was the primary crime scene. I mean, even better so, if we are called to the scenes, then we can offer some assistance right from the start, because by the time we do the post-mortem examination, the body has been refrigerated, obviously. It tends to be the same police officers that attend post-mortem examinations. And I often say those are the guys where we, where we often see them catching somebody and successfully prosecuting somebody as well. The problem is that when they are called to the scene of death, specifically, like you say, in murder cases, it's often not the investigating officer being called to the scene, but a relatively junior police official it's called to the scene. So it's not the person that's going to eventually take over the case and deal with this case and run with it. So by that, we do the post-mortem examination. Often, the, the investigating officer doesn't even know yet that he's got this docket coming his way, depending on how busy we are at the mortuary. So, you know, that makes it quite difficult for them to attend if they don't even know they have a post-mortem to attend. But like I say, there's other officials that that's often then that frequently attends the post-mortem examinations. In a study I did with um, Professor Gerard Labiskafni just after COVID, we looked at the figures of SAPS officials attending post-mortem examinations. That wasn't the, the main aim of the study, but that was one of the things that we looked at. And in the one year, we had a figure of around, I think, 1.6% attendance. In some of the other years, we had 0.8 something percent. So that's that's appalling, you know, that's very, very poor. And I think we have a honest and honest students in forensic sciences actually looking at that as we speak. I think her study is actually looking at the at law enforcement attendance of, of violent crime debts. So that would be interesting to see what her figures show. But like I say, I really, whenever I do a presentation to SAPS, I always tell them that it's really to their benefit and to ours if they attend the post-mortems. And of course, SAPS investigators are just as limited by resources and impacted by the overloading of cases as our forensic pathology department is, which could also impact their ability to attend. No, for sure. You know, if they're sitting with so many dockets on their table, there's no way they can actually spare the time to to come to us as well. Like you say, resources is a problem. I know one of the officers that often attended our postmortems sometimes battled, you know, with with a vehicle. He had to share the vehicle with other detectives. So, you know, there's 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 basics that's lacking and that could contribute to the problem. With Dr. Van Staden clearly carrying many of these cases with her, I wondered whether she had any mechanism to follow up on cases where she wanted to know what the outcome was and the case hadn't gone to court. Sometimes the investigating officers will just let us know this or that has happened. Or um, Specifically, I'm, I'm like the furniture at the mortuary. I think I've been there for so long, so you get used to them and they know you. 
So often they'll give you feedback and let you know. But unfortunately, not all of them are reported on. And we are not all that often called to court. So you often don't actually know what's happened. Sometimes the prosecutors might phone you, specifically if you have testified. I always ask them to please tell me and let me know what's happened. But I want to say 99% of the times we don't actually know. Remember also a lot of what we do are not necessarily murder related. We see a lot of accidents. We see a lot of procedure related deaths as well which wouldn't require our assistance later on once it's been determined that there wasn't any negligence. So often we don't find out what's happened, no. If you haven't yet watched any of Dr. Van Staden's show, Autopsy, on the VIA channel on DSTV, I highly recommend it. It's available on catch-up as well. I'm always curious about how these shows come to fruition, so I asked Dr. Van Staden what led up to the show's creation and what she hopes to achieve with the show. So what's happened is that actually with Gerard, I went to a recording for High School Nutvaar and Levens Dramas and I met the producers there. And when Mark came up with this idea for autopsy, he contacted me and he said that they were looking for an Afrikaans pathologist, which is like I told you, there's not very many pathologists in South Africa, let alone Afrikaans ones. So um, we then started playing around with ideas and that's how I became involved. So it grew from there, throwing ideas around and it simply grew on from there. What we want to achieve, I think, is to actually open the window a little bit and show people what we do, how does it work, what's the work involved behind the scenes, who are the people involved, what goes into any types of crime, or other types of cases. And I think the one thing that's very important for me is to to address this misconception that the police are simply not interested and pathologists, you know, that nobody cares. I think that's the, the idea I sometimes get. And we really do care. There's, there's incredibly committed police officers and pathologists and other scientists working very hard and with a lot of dedication to be able to give people closure and answers and that really carry these things on their heart. And I think that to me was really what I wanted to portray. The cases selected for autopsy are really quite interesting in both subject matter and victim profile. And I wondered how they chose the cases they're covering in season one. So we started off with a lot of the cases as mine, uh, that I did, and I recommended a few cases and cases that I think stood out for me. We then presented them to VIA, who's the, the channel on which the, the program is airing, and they said yes or no to certain cases that we then also had to obtain permission from SAPS because we were speaking to their people. And they also said yes or no to a few cases. So we had to add some new cases then. And then I contacted some of my some of my friends. I actually contacted Yanni De Lange, who's a colonel for the investigative psychology unit, and he recommended a few cases as well. So if I remember, Mark also came up with a few. We it was really a group effort. And then Dr. Van Staden is on a roll. Because she's not only working on the show, but she's also working on her very first book. Yeah, so I've been offered a book contract, basically the same principle as autopsy, but, you know, when it's your own book, uh, well, with any book, I suppose, you have more time to, to tell the broader story. And like in a TV series, you only have, I think, 22, 23 minutes. So there's a relatively limited amount of information you can convey. So in the book, I do a few different cases. I think there's one that overlaps with, with the TV series as well. But I also go into a bit more detail regarding how does a post-mortem examination work? What's the conditions like under which we work? You know, giving a bit more background regarding what we do, how we do it, what the findings are. And often, obviously, then having to stay within the confines of these these cases have either been finalized or, or it was in the media. So that's always very important that you can't discuss something that's still ongoing. But yeah... The the book is being written. Funny enough, the book's being written, like we just said, in English, and it will then probably be translated into Afrikaans as well. 
simply because it's easier for me to, to do my work in English. Um, my grandfather, if he was still alive, would be very disgusted if he heard that. <laughs> but yeah. Dr. von Stalin's book will be out next year, and you can most certainly look forward to another interview with her when that book is released. To wrap up, I asked Dr. von Stalin what she would like the public to know about the work she does, and if there are any misconceptions about forensic pathology she'd like to clear up. Well, I think the first thing they need to understand is that we are compassionate about what we do. We compassionate and passionate about what we do. We are compa- we have compassion for for the the victims that come across our tables, for the people that lie on the table, that we are not heartless and cold. The other thing is, you know, this misconception that TV series have created that pathologists are all these beautiful. Well, I am tall, but I mean, you, they all have this impression about these. People standing in their high-heeled shoes with a Louis Vuitton handbag over the shoulder and with loose hair and doing a post-mortem, you know, that's ridiculous. That's not what we do. I have worked with gum boots and I st- there's often a lot of blood on the floor and, you know, it's, it's very different from what TV is making it look like. So I think they need to understand that we are just basically like everybody else, <laughs> just doing a bit of an unusual job. And really, we don't need these glamorized movie versions of pathologists to make people like Dr. Hestalf and Stardin look like heroes. Because, at least in my mind, they already are heroes. They do the often thankless and extremely difficult but vital work that many wouldn't. And without people like Dr. von Stardin, Many, many families would have no finality about their loved one's cause of death. So, long flowing hair or not, gumboots aside, I think we can all be really grateful that someone like this woman is there, waiting to help us along on the final chapter of our lives, and if need be, help justice to be done. Thank you so much to Dr. Hestalf and Stardin for taking the time to chat with me. I found our conversation absolutely fascinating, and if you haven't yet watched her series, I definitely recommend it. Thank you for listening to my interview with Dr. Hestalf and Stardin. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Lived Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then... Thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.